Hello, welcome to Talking Cop. It's me, Chris Brack. It is the first women's show of the season, and I'm joined by my friends Neil Axon from the Anfield Rap and Emma from BBC. How are we doing? How are we all doing? Very well. Good, thank Good. you. Have you summered well? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> I mean, let's hope you. It was a bit of a hectic summer for you, wasn't it? Yeah, I had the men's year rose, got a new job, so yeah, it's been a been a bit busy trying to buy a house, as Neil knows. So yeah, bit bit yeah. intense. <laughs> yeah, I mean just. I know you're down playing your job as a senior football writer now for the, for women's football. So. Senior women's football reporter. So there yeah, more more of a news slant. So I'm working across a couple of departments. Excellent news. Well done. Uh, and Neil's obviously, uh, if people don't know, he's busy promoting his new book. Yes, whenever, whenever possible. Uh, Transformer, if anyone wants to jump on board. Um, I am of the view it is good. Uh, I want to be clear about this. There were, there were points through the process where I was not of that view. <laughs> so, um, in in, in the, the idea of being one's own worst critic, uh, which I, I'd like to think I'm quite close to, my top three worst critics of me, uh, the fact that I have ended up thinking, you know what, it's actually pretty good this, and you've sort of done what you wanted to do when you started off. So it's very much about nine years, but also what it means uh, going forward and the the work being building blocks to to plan for something new and fresh and different. Um, it is a, an extended uh, tirade against nostalgia. So if you're getting into it because you think it's nostalgic about Klopp, it is not. Uh, it is very much one for the moment. Lovely, lovely. And obviously, I've, I know you've enjoyed doing the audiobook as well, haven't you? Oh, it's been a nightmare. Um, <laughs> honestly, I have a, cha I have a chapter that's, uh, that's uh, eight words of German. A chapter oh, title, that's eight words of German. Oh, no. And what what on earth was I thinking? Like it was very much written by a man who did not realise he was going to have to read this at some point and thought he was oh so clever. Uh, I was furious with myself, <laughs> furious. And 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 then the other thing that happens when you one, when one reads one's own audio book is you, you see the typos. Mm. Typos just come mm. at you, and you you know you the paragraphs a hundred a hundred words long and there's a typo in word seventy six and you're never going to read it successfully. The whole thing's just gone off a cliff like a lemming. It's finished. You're done. Because uh, you can't believe it's gone through so many proofreads and proofreaders. And now suddenly there's... This, why on earth? How on earth has this happened? And then you get to your madly structured sentences. Like, why have I why have I managed to get that, that? In that, that? What, the, what Who says that? That's not something a human ever says. It's something that you write down. It's not something you ever say. So, yeah. Anyway, the whole thing was, it was graft. I'm not going to say don't buy the audio book, but definitely buy the hardback, and you can make oh, a decision I'm, on the audio book. I'm definitely buying the audio book now. You sold it. Hello. You sold it. Audio, <laughs> audio book sales be through the roof now, but nearly. <laughs> Honestly, can you spot where the typo is in, in the, the way he reads it? <laughs> yeah, genuinely. <laughs> cool. So let's talk about Little Women then, because um, I think last episode Emma was just after the season had ended, um, and there was a yeah. few bits of movements. But since it's, it's been one big movement out of the club, and then we'll talk about the Indians. Uh, Missy Bow um, is no longer a Liverpool player. She's been sold to Aston Villa. Um, I think it got a mixed reaction. I think some were quite shocked because, I mean, probably from the outside looking in, she is the most recognisable player. She's the one that's used a lot of the commercial side of it, especially like local derbies and stuff like that. From my perspective, from a football perspective, it kind of felt like a best for both parties. Um, if I was being brutally honest, you asked me to name a little midfield, she wouldn't be in it, but she'd be one of the squad options. And I think for her, she's a talented player and she's clearly decided, I need to play more regular football. So maybe it works out the best of both parties. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think probably from the the outside, the, the shock came from the fact that it, it felt like it came from nowhere, but it was actually something that was kind of rumbling on for sort of, you know, several months, really. I think, as you say there, I think, you know, Missy Bone knew that she wasn't really getting in the Liverpool side consistently. She had fallen down the pecking order in the midfield options that Matt Beard has. Perhaps the style of play that Liverpool play, um, she probably didn't feel suited her best strengths as well. We saw her go and play, well, go and captain the England under-21s and she played in a, in a slightly different role, a bit more as a kind of attacking number 10 um, outright um, than perhaps what she played at Liverpool where she was probably asked to do a bit more box to box, a bit more defensive side of things. And obviously she she started last season actually playing up front because of some of the injuries that, that Liverpool had up front, if if you can remember. So um I think I think she knew where she stood in the pecking order. And as you say, 
I think it was a, a decision that um, took some thought process from her, but I, I'd imagine from conversations that she had with those around her and within the club and also Aston Villa, who have been interested in her for a while. They actually looked at getting her in in the January transfer window and also last summer as well, from what I can understand. So, again, it's not new on their part. Um, and she saw that as a place where there are obviously um, some English players there that she knows well anyway that might be able to help her break into the national team, which ultimately is her priority from a, a personal a personal point of view. Um, and Liverpool saw it as an opportunity to, to cash in on a player who um, they wished well. And at the end of the day, they didn't want to stop in terms of her progression. Um, but equally, from a purely, you know, brutal business point of view, um, they could afford to lose her, basically. So, um, yeah, so they got some money for her that they were happy with. Um, as far as I understand, it could go up to about 100,000 um, K, 100 K if uh, if she's to break into the England squad. Um, there's a few add-ons with like, involved in that deal, so it you know it, there's lots of working parts, but um, that would be a good lump sum for Liverpool to get for a player who um, is still young and um, obviously was was quite far down in the pecking order. I suppose from a marketing point of view, if we're being completely uh, sort of business side of things, um, that's probably where Liverpool might lose, you know, a fair bit of money. Because as you say, she's she's the face of a Liverpool woman. She's the face of the club. She's an academy graduate. So um, obviously they lose something in that sense. Um, but yeah, I think I think all parties were, were pretty OK with it. Um, in an ideal scenario, Liverpool probably would have kept her. But um, equally, I think, I think they're pretty happy with the squad depth that they have in midfield at the moment. Yeah, I mean... Neil, I suppose if we want to try and put a positive on it is when Liverpool are at a point where they can say to some of the quality of Missy, Missy Bow is, you're probably not going to be a regular for us, you're going to be a squad option. That's a quite a step up from where we were probably only two years ago. And that's true. I think what's hard with this is just looking at a couple of areas where you just sort of wonder, are they possibly risking leaving themselves light? I think that's the harder part. Mm. And then as part of that, therefore, does it become, you know, there's enough positives to ensure and someone like Cairns feels as though she's sufficiently involved. Now, you know, I think that that's, that's a tricky one. And I think there is a style of play point. I think Emma's absolutely right. I think that the way Liverpool women play, I don't. I think it, it's in a specific way that struggles for you to pin down the position that I think she'd be at her best in. I don't think she suits the the sort of the five the five three two uh, approach that we've seen, and even <clears throat> even the idea of five two one two, uh, which I think you might see a little bit of this season at times. I think that, that that's almost a little bit tricky for her as well. I to me, she looks like someone who who needs to be the most advanced midfielder in a four three three on a regular basis. And these things feel like a little bit like splitting hairs, but I don't think they are particularly. Um, so I think that there are the sort of ups and downs, pros and cons on it. I do think that, you know, seeing how the fixtures will progress from a Liverpool point of view, the other oddity of this is the way in which the games, as I say, every year on these shows, they just come in such batches as well. So you're either in rhythm and part of the batches or you're not. Um, and I think that that's what makes it hard. And that you can feel like you're a couple light if suddenly you've got five games across what becomes sort of a, a two and a half week period. But the flip side of that is then you might not have a game for two and a half weeks at which point everyone can bandage themselves up and sort all of that out. So you can get to game five and feel a little bit like you're on your last legs, but it's all right because there's about to be a break, whether it's for international football in some cases or just they've decided just to throw one in in other cases. Um, and I think that that, I think in a way that makes sort of squad building hard, but I think it also makes squad management hard. So I've got sympathy for all every all parties here, Liverpool, uh, Missy Bow, and I, but I also think that in general, Villa are getting a good player. And the one thing that I think you can say is, there's continual movement still within the women's game in terms of players. I think it's less than this summer. But if Liverpool need to get her back, that's a real opportunity. I'm sure that that could be arranged if he felt as though there was a home for her. Yeah, I, I agree. So, uh, But moving on to sort of the ins and people's going out. So I think when we spoke, Emma, I think Emma called this to have gone, which was probably the, the, the surprise name that went um, right at the end of the season. So me maybe was under the assumption, well, maybe we'll bring who we bring in. But... It looks more like the opportunity is, is Lucy Parry's to lose, uh, which is uh, again, you know, like the men's team have done with uh, Young Bradley. You know, 
when she's played, she's looked good. You know, she's I think having a, a year away on loan has done a, done the world of good. The fact they're giving the number two shirt is generally a, a key sign that they're going. This is something we're hanging our hat on. So again, that's I suppose that's the opportunity that comes, and you know, you've still got the likes of Hannah Silkar, Zara Shaw, who have also going to get opportunities this year. So maybe that is where Lippo are trying to go with give a few more of the youth players an opportunity while still having a very strong spine to work with. Yeah, that's that's absolutely fine. Lucy Parry will be the starting right back for Liverpool this season, um, from what I've been told. Um, and as you say, she's got a number two shirt. It's pretty obvious, I think. So, um, yeah, that that's that was the plan. That was the thinking behind um, Emma Corbisto leaving, was opening the door to Lucy Parry. Um, I still think um, we need strength and depth in full-back positions. I, I, I am quite disappointed we haven't gone into the market. Um, I probably want to see at least two come in. Um, I know that, you know, we've got we've got a couple of targets that have already sort of lined up, maybe even some pre-contracts signed for January. Don't know who those players are. Um, I would be extremely surprised if one of them isn't a fullback. Um, I'd be extremely disappointed if one of them isn't a fullback. Um, and that's nothing against Lucy Parry. Um, I think she's a brilliant player and um, brilliant potential. Um, but I do think it's uh, it's a lot of responsibility to put on her shoulders to go from kind of someone who um, has not really been around the squad, obviously being on loan. Um, when she has been here, she's played a mixture of roles. Started off as a as a right forward <laughs> when she first broke it broke into the first team. Um, looked really good when she has played a, a right back, but it's um, it's completely different playing games for ninety minutes every week in the WSL at the level that that now is. Um, and then trying to compete in cup competitions and maybe the um, the stress on your body that that gives that she might not be used to playing at that level every week, um, but also the level of responsibility, um, yeah, the scrutiny, etc. There's, there's a lot in there that will be a big change for her. I have no doubt that she can deal with that. It's just how, can she deal with that over a, a season? And and if she can't, let's say she, you know, she has a couple of bad games, um, have we got enough depth there? I know, um, you know, Matt thinks that, you know, Grace Fisk obviously is a good backup option for there. But personally, I think she's um, our best defender. Um, I wouldn't be moving her anywhere from centre back ever. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I mean there's options there. I think he, he likes having players who can play multiple role, roles, and he always has said that. Um, you look at the likes of Jazz Matthews, for example. She's been rewarded for that for her versatility, but. I just, I just think if Liverpool want to make that next step to really break into the top three, which is what they say their their ambitions are for the season, um, then I think we need to get players who are um, in that top three bracket in specialised positions, um, and then you can then worry about squad depth after that. I think so. Yeah, that's kind of where I stand. But like I say, nothing against Lucy Parry. Really exciting talent, and I'm excited to see what she can do this season. I just think we need we need to give her a little bit more support. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. In terms of the incomings then, so we've had three. We've had Olivia Smith, a young, exciting Canadian forward who, correct me if I'm wrong, we've broken a club record fee yeah. for her. So, I mean, Neil, just, we just spoke about focusing on Olivia Smith. When you hear club record fee broken, that does all, that does bring an air of, this is something exciting then. This is something we should keep an eye on. But also, it's a big sign of faith in her that, you know, Liverpool decided to really go for that level for her. Yeah, and you, you're looking at a footballer who's in a situation where so far in in a, in a club career she's gone at uh, effectively a goal a game. Um, a young club career as well, you'd point out. So it's, it's just there's a ton of talent there. Obviously, there's a question mark over the She's playing for the second best team in Portugal. Um, and the quality of the rest of that league is up you know, up for, up for debate. But it's worth pointing out that Sporting have found themselves into the Champions League. So Sporting aren't mugs. Uh, let's be clear about that. They've had to go through some qualifiers there and play in the Champions League as well this season. So she's moved from there to come to Liverpool. Sporting probably won't get through in the Champions League. They've got Real Madrid uh, when I was having a little look at it before. So they probably do get knocked out at that point. But it is worth saying that she's been playing for a good side, starting for a good side and scoring goals for a good side. The quality of the opposition is the is the sort of the debatable aspect. But goal scoring is goal scoring to an extent. And so it's exciting that Liverpool have managed to pick her up. The idea that they've had to, you know, be really bold in terms of what they paid for, I think, is good. I think it's a little bit of a funny shift, really, where you know, with Keenan coming back and Enderby being another year older, 
it's a, it's a funny one, really, where in years gone by, I mean, and this is before a, a competitive ball's been kicked, but, it, you know, if we're having these conversations, one of the things that always worries me is I'm looking at Liverpool sides last couple of seasons going, I'm just not sure there's enough goals in them. The, you know, where, where, where Roman Hogg ends last season, as I say, Keenan coming back in and, and impressing as much as she did with Smith, with M, with Enderby, um, with Copics as well, even. You're able yeah. to sort of turn around and go, suddenly this looks like, it looks actually really well stocked in mm. there, you wonder whether or not there might be a bit of an eye in the early going of the season if Smith gets some opportunities maybe a little bit deeper from time to time that she's going to buttress those midfield positions as much as she's going to sort of play in the leading line uh, from a Liverpool point of view. And it'll be interesting to see that as it develops what the what the plan is. But I think it is it is legitimately exciting. I think people who are going to you know be going to the matches, there's, there's, there's real reason to be excited by it, uh, to see the way in which it develops. You know, this is... It's an interesting signing. It's it's a good side, and I think that you know Liverpool can can go into the season feeling like they know where the goals are. To Emma's point, you do sort of have concerns around what 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 is going on predominantly in those wing back positions. The only other thing that occurs to me is you know is it possible that this is the season where there's going to be a bit of a visible shift uh, more often away from the three and into more of a four. Um, what doesn't help us in that is that so far the the preseason game that we've got the the, the information on is was against Manchester City, mm. and I think that you know it's perfectly legitimate for for Liverpool to be playing games against Manchester City and and choosing to go into them with a back three, you know. But if this is the year where Liverpool are maybe going to draw a delight, divine line from everyone who's above them, who finished above them last season, and have the attitude that home and away they're going to go with a back three and then look at everyone beneath them, or at least the bottom sort of four or five and be going out, going into it with a back four, then that may well be an opportunity there where maybe there's a little less of an onus. Maybe the idea, for instance, of Fisk being Liverpool's best defender, well, she could be Liverpool's best defender from right back in a bit of a traditional right back sort of role. The issue becomes when you're asking these players to first and foremost do endless shuttles up and down the pitch, but also as part of that, be able to contribute a great deal in attacking areas. And that's, that's, and that's where you need specialists. You need specialist wing backs, almost let alone full backs to Emma's point. And that's where you do sort of, you, you, you do have, so you can talk about wanting there to be uh, flexibility and variety uh, and versatility in your players, but it's hard playing fullback and it's not the sort of, sorry, it's hard playing wing back and it's not the sort of thing a centre half can easily just go and take to. Mm. Yeah. So, Emma, in terms of the other signs, uh, Neil's mentioned we've got uh, Cornella Capo, Capos. I'm never going to get that name wrong. Copic, I think. Copic. Copic. Yeah. There we go. I knew you'd get it wrong. What, what can you tell us about, about Copic then? Because I don't know much about her, but. Yeah, not much at all. Um, I think I think that's that's the beauty of it, really, is that she came in, she was quite an unknown, um, which I think in itself, uh, well, I mean, it could be a bad thing, it could be a good thing, but I think it, yeah. it shows maybe how far the recruitment has come um, at Liverpool Women. Um, even if you just look back a few years ago, there'd be a lot of names that just came from kind of England and, and maybe, you know, a couple of the top European um, sides, but now looks like we're expanding the recruitment pool a little bit more. Obviously, we dipped into the Asian market to get in Fuka Nagano. Um, we looked at obviously the Austrian market and brought in Marie Hobinger, who was playing her football in Germany, obviously as well. Um, so yeah, I think this is just another another one in in that kind of bracket where you know she's a bit more unknown. Um, she's young. She's obviously got potential. There's there's talent there. But when you look at the the statistics, you can obviously see that. Um, you know, she's had a fair bit of, of decent game time at a senior level. So, um, scored goals, scored, scored a really good number of goals. goals. Yeah, scored a lot of goals. So, yeah, so I, I think there's on paper, there's a decent player there. Um, but beyond that, I don't think we know much about her. Um, hearing from some of the other teammates and obviously from Matt Beard, um, a, across a couple of events kind of in the last week or so, it's been quite interesting hearing them talk about the new signings. Um, everyone mentions the fact that Olivia Smith has um, kind of got this uh, this technique in terms of the way she hits the ball that's ridiculous. And then when they speak about Kovic, they you know they they speak about kind of her intelligence, which is which is quite interesting. So um, yeah, that's that's a thing that people are kind of saying. But yeah, I suppose until we see her, um, it's it's difficult to know what her role will be in the team, what position she'll play, and and where she'll fit in among those other forwards. 
Yeah, and the final sign we've done so far is uh, Gemma Evans from Man United. Uh, again, cover cover a uh, more centre back cover, is it? Yeah, I think she she obviously you know she is a centre back. That's her position. Um, she played at left back for Manchester United last season. They had a lot of injuries in that department, um, but she is right footed. So um, I think there is there's a bit of a loss of balance there. But she's played at left back um, at Reading. Um, Matt Beard has 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 seen her at Bristol City playing in that position a little bit as well. But she is a centre back. But I'd imagine she has been brought in. Um, I would think as left back. Um, but again, until I suppose we know as Neil rightly says, whether or not it's going to be a back four or a back five, I do think that makes a big difference um, in, you know, how Gemma Evans might be used. But I think, yeah, I think the fact, again, we know that Beardy likes that versatility and she can play in two positions. So um, I think that that's why he's brought her in. Cool. And then finally, Neil, uh, we've had a couple of extensions and that was now uh, Rachel Laws has had an extension. Captain Ifar, he's uh, got another extension. Uh, I think there is an element of a coaching role involved in that as well, which is which is helping future-proofing her career post-football. And then Keenan's got an extension, which is uh, nice to see because, you know, she's had a horrible year yeah. or so of injuries. So it's actually nice that she's got herself back, got herself back fit and got herself a, another opportunity with Liverpool, which is great to see. Yeah, it, it, well, it just seems really positive. And, you know, there's there's so much stuff um, around this you know, the, the, where the, again, I'll say again, an attack, you know, that the feels as though there's the opportunity for real combinations there. I and mean, we've even seen aspects of it already. Um, you know, there's, the, I feel as though they are, you know, if, if, if Copics does well, then we're in a situation where I, I'm optimistic. We're sort of talking about five really good options for two positions and different types to see what you want to blend. But it might be that it becomes three positions. It might be that it becomes a little bit different. And Keenan can be a big part of that as well. The key thing to sort of say is that she shows it towards the back end of the season that she's a goal scorer again. If it needed a reminder, um, you know, she does that at the end of last season. I think it's a really good, it's good news. It's a good move. Um, but I think it also, what it says, the, the signal it says to everyone is that she's very much good to go in terms of being a you know being a, a an option this season and, and you're not that far away from it becoming the cliched sort of and it's also like a new signing liverpool achieved what they achieved last season a great deal of it actually without leanne so you know i think that that's when we talk about some of the outs in there as well it's worth saying that last season you know you can talk about where mel lawley does or doesn't get a games or van den sanden does or doesn't get a games but whatever that amasses to it's reasonable to expect Keenan to be able to match, if not to pass that time on the pitch from a Liverpool point of view. And they were playing, you know, broadly speaking, in attack. So I'm I'm you know, I think it's I think it's a, it's it's good news. Um, but I think I think the signal it sends is is the best news in that if they'd have had any doubts or if they'd have had serious you know, at least sort of semi serious doubts, they wouldn't be doing it. We've seen enough of this Liverpool setup to know they're absolutely ruthless. So mm. the fact that it hasn't happened, I think, suggests that they're, they're expecting a good and big season from her. Yeah, which is what we're seeing, Neil, isn't it? Just goals, goals, goals. No reason to get down to St. Helens. Um, yeah. Speaking of St. Helens, um, Emma, we've got final pre-season game this Sunday, which is against Everton, you know. Uh, so that should, hopefully we'll get a home derby win. That'll be nice, wouldn't it? We're, we're yeah. for, actually, I don't know if we've had one since, uh, since we're at Witness. That's how long it is. <laughs> had a home derby. Yeah. So... Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing how how the setup is at St. Helens. You know, everything about it is new for everyone. You know, so around the ground and in the ground. So yeah, tickets still available as well if people are going to come to it, both blues and reds. So you know, should should be good because good to actually see some football. Yeah, totally wicked. That's what uh, that's what the stadium was called when we got the uh, when we saw the announcement and. Uh, I was pretty disappointed when I found out that my byline couldn't be Emma Sanders at the Totally Wicked Stadium because if it if it was, I would be there every week. But apparently, that breaks BBC rules. So um, you'd, have you'd have a T-shirt saying "Totally Wicked Emma Sanders." I would. I just think it's totally wicked. Um, yeah. So anyway, get on to the game because it will be totally wicked. Hopefully, if Liverpool win, um, it, it is exciting. It's new, new facilities, new surroundings. Um, a lot. I know we discussed this at, at the um, end of last season, but a lot of a lot of flexibilities that that come with that in terms of, um, you know, Liverpool can kind of brand it a little bit more in the way that they want to. Um, and yeah, in terms of marketing, I think they feel that there's more to offer um, for a match day experience. So yeah, this I suppose this is this is the trial run. See what they can do first game. Um, obviously a derby as well, so it's a good one to open up to and sort of set the scene before the season starts. 
Um, and then obviously when the season starts, you know, it's not too long. I think it's a couple of weeks before um, we're off to Anfield for, for Liverpool Manchester City. So, yeah, some some good um, good match days to look forward to early on in the season at, at different venues, I think, where where the club can kind of put on lots of different things and, and make it, um, yeah, make it a good occasion, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, Neil, that's the other big positive we've got to go to this season. We've got three games at Anfield this year now, which is, you know, the most we've had for a while. So, again, this is get, trying to get bigger crowds, getting, you know, getting playing the biggest stages, which is what Arsenal and Chelsea do. And it's building that fan base up. Yeah, I think I think one of the key things, I, I, you know, I'm glad. I think that the season ticket's a good idea uh, from the Anfield point of view. The I'd say the hat trick ticket's a good idea from the Anfield point of view. I, I I think they need to open more of the ground for it because they need to give people the opportunity to go into different parts of the ground and have different experiences. Hopefully that'll happen if the you know if they shift the requisite numbers and they're doing it one stage at a time. But I think that the for me, it isn't just the idea of playing three at Anfield. I think it's playing three at a full Anfield and being really clear with people about the fact that you can return. This is the date of the next game and going from there. And then also being really clear about the fact that you can go to the game at St. Helens as well. And this is how you do that. And this, this is how this works. I think that the, the shift that I think Arsenal have led is the idea that it's perfectly fine for the crowd to be different. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's a really important sort of piece of learning for the whole for the whole league, really. And as part of the sort of the wider um, step towards what was, and still I think is getting called NUCO um, around the, the WSL, I think that that remains just a, I think it remains something that needs to be sort of, needs to be acknowledged and worked with, with, but not necessarily constantly within. I think you can work both with it and you don't have to just feel as though you're, you're absolutely stuck by it. But I think it's an important shift uh from where we were sort of eight nine years ago and i think it's one which uh, as i say i feel as though on the whole it'll it'll carry more weight but then from there then you need to make sure that you, you're giving people positive experiences um and you're giving them reasons to return um the, the first and best way to do that is by playing some excellent football right away you know and also well winning yeah. whichever team have been supported but just in general as well the standard of football on display being what you want it to be um but also making sure you've got the follow-up communications to sort of say to people, right, you went to that one, but now there's this one. And even if you can't necessarily get to this one at St. Helens, this, you know, almost being in touch with people in terms of how they get on and things like that is something that's occurred to me recently and making that easier for people as well, how to see highlights. Just being really clear on that. It's almost the com- the communication around it's got to be almost everything. You've got to give people a pathway into everything and then let them find the pathway that they want rather than the way in which I think it's been, which is the ticket part very much focuses on the ticket part. Um, I think that, for instance, there'd be nothing wrong with, you know, pushing through people who bought tickets, sending them match reports of games that they haven't been able to attend. Um, and as I say, sending them the links, therefore, to watch the highlights and things like that. I think that that's almost got to be the next the next sort of step of this in order to keep people involved and engaged over the course of the campaign, along with people like us doing things like this and sending that uh, around as well. But I think, I, I think it's what's important is, is acknowledging that the audiences are, will, there will be crossover, but they also can be different uh, between the men's game and the women's game. And as I say, I think that that's, if you want to talk about Arsenal and Chelsea in particular, and especially Arsenal have done really successfully. Uh, I think it's that, I think that Chelsea have gone down a slightly, not different path, but obviously haven't been quite as focused on the idea of getting as much football into Stamford Bridge, not least because I think the previous manager didn't really like it very much. Sure. Um, and so, you know, I think that, but but I think that all the managers almost need to swallow that um, and say that well, what, the best thing that can happen is that everyone can play in front of as many people as possible. And if we can keep doing that and do that more often, more than three, we've done three this year, we're going to do three this year. If we can get to five the year after uh, and then seven the year after that, then it's not that much of a leap then to 11. Yeah, I think, I think that's the, the way it's going to go. Um, while it's, you want the competitive advantage of home, you know, like which Liverpool did with Prenton Park, mm. it's still a very young league and it's still about growing the league as well and growing awareness to get more eyes in it because more eyes in it means more people watching it which means it grows naturally then that's how you, that's how you generate more money into it yeah although it is, it's an interesting debate because actually um you know when we use chelsea and arsenal there as two examples they are completely different in the way that they've approached it as neil says but chelsea's yeah. purely from a financial decision obviously yes 
I agree, um, Emma Hayes pushed in terms of she liked the King's Meadow side of it as well. But Chelsea are undergoing a whole new sort of commercial identity around the women's team where they've literally employed like a new marketing team. I think that there's obviously a debate there that um, that's partly to sort of work the finances into different positions in order to help the men's team. There's an argument there. But certainly from a woman's point of view, what they're trying to do is they're charging full price for tickets at Stamford Bridge. You know, they're charging 30, 40 quid to go and watch the women's team at Stamford Bridge. Um, some people might not want to do that. So therefore, you're then getting scenarios where you might only get 20,000 as opposed to the 60,000 that Arsenal will get by selling um, slightly cheaper tickets. So there's pros and cons to both because Chelsea see it as a, a business model where they want to be sustainable. So they want to get to a point where they're then making a profit. And then when they then make a profit, they can reinvest in terms of other things and then build towards getting a full stadium, but having already set the precedent of your paying, you know, £40 for, for tickets. Um, so it is, it's a different business model, whereas Arsenal obviously are prioritising what I think we're probably all in agreement with, which is um, the reach and the, the audience for women's football at this stage. Um, they're sort of going by it there first and going, OK, we build a fan base and we, we build something that people want to come back to. Then we can start charging what, you know, we think they they think it's worth. Um, so it's two completely different modules there in terms of like the way that they, they look at things. But I think, yeah, I think Liverpool are probably um, of the mindset of, of Arsenal um, where, you know, it's about building building bums on seats. But again, with the view for it to being financial. So. Um, I think there's a hesitancy, for example, to just, let's say, just open up the whole stadium because by opening up certain parts, obviously, that costs money. So yeah. that's why they're doing it in stages so that they can fill out a stand and go, OK, right, box that one off, move on. Now we open up the next part. So um, Liverpool are probably a cross between the two. Um, so it's it's a really interesting discussion um, that all clubs are having and um, the new takeover company is having. Um, and I think... Um, each club is doing it slightly differently. So it'll be interesting to see just how Liverpool do. But I really like the idea of picking three teams that are geographically close. Therefore, you're targeting an audience that, you know, can travel geographically. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and all three are also kind of natural rivals or opponents of, of the men's team. So there's already that kind of conscious um I suppose rivalry already existing in in people's minds when they come to Anfield to watch the women play against Manchester City, Manchester United, and Everton. So, um, yeah, it's three big ticks for me, and um, and as Neil says, hopefully we can move towards then increasing to five five games at Anfield, seven games, and then hopefully eleven. Yeah, and, ho and hopefully a derby win. That's all I need. This year. Yeah. I'll be quite, I'll be quite content. I'll be quite content then. Uh, but you've mentioned it's good. It's last. It's good. It's last. It's yeah. not. It's not like it's the game at Anfield. It being mm. last, I think, helps um, mm. in that regard. I, you know, I'm I'm pleased the derby is last. Um, I think there's. I, th I think on it, if it had been just the derby, you'd have been pulling your hair out. I would like them to have not done the derby. In to be mm. dead honest. Because I think you can not least because it would also be interesting to see what would actually happen at the new stadium if they were to do the like for instance what does it look like if we don't know what how many they're going to get into the new stadium yet but for instance does that help the new stadium become a sellout can you almost do it that way where you you have three before then and, and almost like your your aim is to see can you can you sell out because it's the last home game can you sell that one out and go from there um, and then for, you know build that momentum into the following season. And I also just think you're in a situation where it is genuinely like it's the greatest day on earth for the Everton players, and it's a, it's a, it's a weight on the back of the Liverpool players. And I think that you'd, that's one where I would bear the sporting in mind. I also think there's something interesting that they'll need to discover at some point as to what happens when it is Leicester mm -hmm. coming to play at Anfield, um, and almost sort of the learning on that and going from there. So I, in an ideal world, I'd rather I'd rather they hadn't picked a derby. I, don't, I can see the, the logic in the two Manchester ones. I can see the logic in Everton, don't get me wrong, but I can see the logic in the two Manchester ones. But what does it look like if it's the last home game of the season and it's a you know, sort of the second to last home game of the season and it's it's a, it's a smaller side, but Liverpool have got something to play for? How many can we get into Anfield then and what does that look like? And at some point, we've got to do that bit of learning. I'd like it to have been this season, but I I, I'm not saying I don't understand why they pick Everton. I just hate it. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree on that on that point about the competitive um, knock on note, I, I, that was something I did look at and think, 
you know what, that's interesting because the last couple of derbies have been early on in the season. Um, and I think, like, as in the, the, the home derbies, but the fact it is later on this season, it it has been in the back of my mind that actually that could have a bearing on on sort of Liverpool's finish in the season. Um, the you know, the Goodison always the Goodison derby's always been a bit more closer and competitive because there's generally something to ride on it. It's, it's always been the Goodison derby near the end of the season. Mm, yeah, exactly. And I would have preferred that this time around as well. Um, but it's the other way around this year. I think I need to have a look at the fixtures again. But yeah, it feels it just feels it's a lot later. It is. No, it is. It's, it's in May. It's May twenty five. Um, you know, it's literally. You know, it's 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 May twenty five at the minute. The week before, they've got Tottenham um, in the at home, and you just sort of wonder could could we just have had that one one way or another? Mm. I'm not quite sure whether or not there's there's a potential clash with the men's team, which I know there isn't on the fourth of May. I think that the the men's team, if I remember rightly off the top of my head, are away at somewhere like Aston Villa that weekend, so they can sort of have a level of certainty around that. And it might be that the week before they're not. But you know these things can be arranged, and we know conversations are had. I think I think that Liverpool ultimately want to put the Merseyside derby at Anfield. I just sort of disagree with it um, because, as I say, it's it's it'll be brilliant when they do win one, and I think it'll feel like a real weight off. But until that happens, I think they'll be. It's I think it's just psychologically really hard for these players. Now the ideal is that they've won one or at least uh, well two, but at least one of the earlier games at Anfield. So the idea of the winner Anfield is under their belts. I just think that last year, you know, it was a great example of they were much better than Everton for 15 minutes. They don't score. And then it's almost like the weight of everything is just too much. And Everton just begin to really enjoy themselves. And it was an Everton side that the table at the end of the season shows wasn't as good as Liverpool. But they really got to enjoy their day at Anfield um, in a way which, to me, suggested they understand needle. Because guess what? They really do. Um, and not just because they're Evertonian, but because they're humans. And I think that Liverpool are just hanging themselves out to to a needly, horrible Merseyside derby where nil nil is a great result for Everton because it keeps the hoodoo of Liverpool not winning and coming. Yeah. And yeah. it makes Everton's mind up and they can just sit in and play for a nil nil. And then guess what? They'll get a chance at some point on the break. And if they score it, it'll feel like there's a mountain to climb. But it is mainly because of Evertonian's nil. Let's let's be clear. <laughs> uh, as speaking, of, speaking <laughs> of a very needly human, I don't think that's true. <laughs> so, Emma, uh, you both mentioned... Um, Newco, uh, which for listeners who aren't aware, is this is the first season where the WSL and the Championship are no longer under the control of the FA. It's now run by a company called Newco, so a bit like how the Premier League's its own entity. What, are, what are sorry, what are they saying to expect from them, and what do we realistically expect from them? Uh, I say them, about- I don't because I don't know who they are. So. Shameless article plug, literally uh, just written something. It's taken me about four hours today. It's going out on Wednesday, if you're listening to this. So uh, while we're recording it, that's that's the next day. Um, yeah, it, oof, it's complicated. It's actually not called Nuco now. Um, they have changed their name in the last couple of weeks to Women's Professional Leagues Limited. Um, that is also another temporary name. Um, Rolls of the tongue, on it? Yeah, so WPLL is how um, they're referred to. Um, so we've gone from um, unnamed takeover company to Nuco to WPLL, and that will change again when they've decided what the new name is. So all very fun and exciting roller coaster. Um, yeah, lots going on, um, but not much really being said. Um, I think it's probably fair to say. Um, I think they're still forming the company. Um, so there's certain roles that still haven't been filled. They literally only started about four weeks ago um, in terms of the, the official process of the takeover. Um, so for the last year and a half, it's basically been doing the legal documentation of actually handing over from the FA and also getting all um, clubs in the top two tiers of English women's football to basically sign up to it. So um, it's club owned. Um, it's independent from the FA. But there is a board that the FA sit on, the Premier League sit on. Um, and I can't say too much because it's under embargo. Um, there's certain elements of both of those companies which will be helping, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, apart, aside from that, it is essentially a, an, ind- an independent company of its own. Um, so within that, there's obviously lots of challenges in that they've got to try and get everyone on board to make decisions around scheduling, around broadcast rights, um around uh ownership um so you know uh you've got a load of let's say independent owners within 
both tiers. Some of them are like, well, I don't, I don't like what you're trying to do here. And then if they don't like it, they're not going to pump money into it. So um, they've got to basically um, try and prove to all of these club owners that there's something worth investing in and that they're going to make some money out of it. Um, but obviously at the start, there is no money. Um, so I think, I think it could be a long process from what it sounds like. Um, but yeah, they're kind of in the early stages. I think the priority is the fact that broadcast deal runs out next next season. Um, they signed a one-year contract extension with BBC and Sky Sports for this season um, so that there is money coming in to the league, but also that obviously the games are being shown on TV. So that's obviously the priority is to make that um, next step for next season, get that in place. Um, and also to try and find a sponsor for the Women's League Cup. You know, um, the fact it's called the Women's League Cup now and it was oh, called... Was oh, called the Continental Cup. Tires Cup, which everyone knew is a Conti Cup. So, um, and the group stages for that starts on the second of October. So, um, time is running out um, on both of those fronts. So, um, without being able to say too much more, they're probably the two priorities at the moment. It's okay. a general perception. I think there's more money around than there is. I think that because what happens is that whenever there, there is a deal struck, certainly the last TV deal, it, there was a desire, obviously, from the people who were putting the money in to act as though it was mega bucks. And that, that sort of offered the perception that there was suddenly mega books around the women's game. Um, there was some really interesting stuff from Swiss Ramble who broke down where money was or wasn't going uh, over the summer uh, for the women's teams where he could. He had to make some guesses in some places because not dissimilar to men's football. And in fact, in part, I think because of men's football, it's remarkably opaque at times to see where the money flows. You know, we still only through really the work of Emma do we get any sense of of a hint of transfer fees um you know it's not it's nowhere near the same, as much put into the public domain for instance in that area as there is in the men's game um i think it's it remains you know that that sort of stuff therefore makes sort of commentary on it a little bit difficult but i think it's really important for people listening to this just to have a real awareness there is not lots and lots of cash sloshing around the women's game the teams at the top um as swiss ramble demonstrated are massively subsidized uh, by the by the by the men's team um and there's a lot of people who are trying to talk a certain game around support to to, to women's football um who act try to act as though it's it, it's much more of a financial thing than it is and as i say that's not me that's not me necessarily even talking anybody down i just think it's an important thing to remember um it does not cost that much to share to sponsor the front of a of a, a bottom half wsl women's team it genuinely does not cost that much money at all to do that. Um, I don't want to say how much I know that once someone's paid for, but it is less than the price of a terraced house, um, mm -hmm. is what I would say. And I think so. I think that there's this is this remains the 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 issue. There'll need to be obviously the TV deal that Emma's talking about, but I think that the the overall flow, I think needs to needs to end up being being greater and that's why you know when we're talking about these competing models earlier on i think they are very very interesting in terms of where it can end up um but i think it is something which and that, that isn't to say what i said before i'm i very much do think that the the men's teams in question should be uh subsidized in the women's game uh, because i think there's a long-standing issue really with what happened to the women's game in this country from 1921 until you know 1971 i think it's worth acknowledging that and that that should be there but what i'd actually argue is that should therefore be a much more formalized process mm -hmm. so it doesn't deserve, it doesn't come down to the grace and favor of each individual men's club as to how much they are or aren't prepared to put in but instead for instance when the men are negotiating a tv deal or the men's team is negotiating a tv deal there's a set figure that is going to for instance move that way between now and in lieu of when the other thing happens and i think that the campaign around equality of payments round by round for the fa cup is one that i would genuinely sort of throw my weight behind i think that there's no reason not to do that at this stage with where the fa cup is um you know a lot of that therefore doesn't require men's teams down the pyramid to, to suffer or struggle it requires the idea of a, a of there being a more sort of balanced approach to that side as well and then elsewhere I think in general it needs some sort of big thinking and you know i look forward to reading emma's piece around it really but one of the problems with all of it is that it just always ends up so secretive mm -hmm. um and it always ends up as i say so opaque but part of the reason as i say why i think it's opaque is because no one wants to say people are getting x you think it's worth x times 10 and in reality it's actually just worth x or what it's yeah. worth is separate to what's actually being paid 
and then the journey that money goes on is exceptionally stretched so i think it's i think it, it remains a challenge i think that is is beyond what currently gets put into the public domain or the way in which people act yeah yeah i, I agree on this on the uh communication it is a bit cloak women's football always has felt a bit cloak and dagger for me uh, yeah. unless you know unless you know someone you know look i know you emma otherwise <laughs> you generally would just you find out on the day oh, i would bought this person i mean I yeah I mean, that's, that's I, I, but even like in the grander context of i wouldn't you wouldn't know if a club was in financial trouble no well, then, but you, know, you know yeah yeah, yeah, you, you get a well. sense of it. You get a sense of it. But even there, though, again, another issue becomes, well, you do find out if a women's club's in, in financial trouble because what's actually realistically the case is the men's arm's in financial trouble and they're taking it yeah. out on the women's aspect. Yeah. And I had there's two or three very recent examples of that. And this is back to, there's got to be the way to, to encourage the women's teams to be able to be, you know, the flip side of this is though you don't want and this is the other part of why this is an ongoing and it's complicated arguments and, and the, the you know the carney review is very interesting for it because it throws up a lot of questions but it can't always give answers because of where the conflicts are um yeah. you know i've got tons of sympathy for karen through the process that she went through where for instance you know the idea of simply time slots and things like that are exceptionally complicated and she you know she can make a recommendation but finding the way to do that is is different from being from making a recommendation in in real terms you know i think that there's something in in this this idea of what you get to find out when but also where the reliance is and whether or not it should be reliance and what you do about that in 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 a wider sense it's such a funny thing that there's so much we mentioned my book my book deal, uh, touches on this there's so much money in football in this country yeah but what we can't therefore argue for, though, is that in some areas there needs to be less in, the, in terms of the total. It's actually a conversation about where it gets distributed to. And that's actually just a conversation about will. It's not yeah. really, there doesn't need to be any more, that we, everyone, everything could do with more money. It certainly couldn't do with less, but there needs to be will about where it's going to go. But I think part of how you get the will is you also get it through the transparency. But we also don't want a situation where effectively, it might suit us as Liverpool people, but we don't want a situation where the top six in the, 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 the Women's League is exactly the same as the top six in the Men's League. And there's not much that you can do about that. That is not actually a good place to be. Uh, for the idea to grow in the game and then within that we don't want or we shouldn't want some people might but we shouldn't want the the whatever the wpll to end up effectively just being like it like the premier league and doing things exactly the same way and i think that 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 is such a difficult and complicated conversation not least because there are the people who are at the top of the wpll or at the top flights of the wsl who are able to say well we're currently putting in five million a year Mm -hmm. we are we're currently subsidizing this to the tune of five million a year so we do want more say and we do want more control and we do want this and we do want this but part of the reason why they're doing that there's, there's a variety of reasons why they may be doing that um i think i think i don't envy anyone who's really involved in it in that i think there's lots of aspects to at times get on television and talk it all up but then you're almost complicit therefore in in not therefore being able to say well actually partners aren't giving as much money as you think they are yeah. uh, it's it's a really really difficult thing to have an honest conversation about and emma knows more about it than me so i shouldn't have spoken as long as she should have spoken for longer no it's, it's difficult because uh yeah because i can't actually say too much now give it give it 48 hours so um <laughs> so neil's, neil's spoken a lot of stuff um which i probably couldn't really touch on so that's yeah i'm nodding along well, hopefully you don't think i'm too far off base <laughs> no, no I, I was nodding in a in a embargoed agreement <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that's a great phrase. Asterix either side. <laughs> um, <laughs> Some might say. This is um, so let's go back to the WSL, the actual season then. Yes, please. Uh, Emma, please. Emma, we've not we've not seen your fantastic prediction e email yet. When does that come out? Oh god, you put me on the spot. Yeah, I'm writing that at the moment as well. Yeah, it's coming out next week. It'll be that's there. Next week. We'll we'll go try and get a preview of it. Um, so from your guys' perspective, who do you think of the runs and riders for like title slash european spots and who are we thinking could struggle this year i mean outside looking in villa seems to have done a lot of business so you would think villa would do better than they did last year i think last year was a bit of a disappointment for aston villa as a whole but they do seem to have bought smartly you know and they do add into their squads but i'm assuming we're thinking it's oh think it's liverpool and last year's and the other big four that we normally expect 
Uh, I think I think the top three is definitely Chelsea, Manchester City, Arsenal. I think in the order of perhaps Manchester City as champions this year. Um, I just can't see them missing out on another year. They were quite comfortably the best playing team, in my opinion, last season. Um, and I, I think they threw it away. Um, you know, they obviously lost on goal difference. Um, Chelsea just completely, it was just ridiculous, really, what they were able to do in terms of goal scoring in the last two games. Obviously, winning 8 0 in the penultimate weekend literally won them the WSL title. Um, crazy. Uh, but I do I do think this year could be Man City's year. I think they've had a fantastic transfer window. Some of the players they brought in is ridiculous um, to an already strong squad. And they've got Jill Ward, who was obviously out with an ACL injury, to come back in. And she is one of the best players in the world. So um, I think City might just edge it. But you look at the Chelsea squad and it's absolutely ridiculous as well. They've got Sam Kerr to come back as well from an ACL injury. They've also strengthened in the market. Sonia Bumpaston, the new manager, I think is unbelievable manager. Um, I think, you know, people talk about obviously losing Emma Hayes, quite clearly one of the best managers in the world, but Sonia Bumpaston is one of the best managers in the world. Um, phenomenal coach. So very excited to see what they can do, but I do think City might have said it. Um, and I think Arsenal will miss out again um, because I just think City and Chelsea look more consistent. They look more solid. Their, their depth for me looks better. Um, and I just think they've, they've got better coaches, if I'm being honest. Um, and then in terms of teams that might struggle, I think West Ham are in, are in trouble. And I say this with a week to go, well, not even a week, um, three or four days to go of the transfer window. Um, they need a lot. They need to do a lot. Um, I don't think they'll, they'll get they'll get what they need. Um, I think they're in trouble. Um, and I think, sadly, um, we're in a position where the team's coming up. It's such a big big step that I think Crystal Palace will struggle like Bristol City did last season. So for me, they're, they're the two that are going to be near the bottom, I think, um, unless West Ham pull some money out of their ears and, and start investing and, and bringing in some players. Um, yeah, that's where I sort of see the top three and then the bottom two. Um, and then I think the middle, I mean, I can't call it at the moment. I've tried to write it and I, I just think it's ridiculous. I think Obviously, local squad's good. Manchester United have, for me, had one of the best transfer windows of the entire league, the players that they brought in. Um, Brighton have brought in some serious talent. Um, Villa have done well. Um, yeah, I can't choose between any of them. And then you've got Tottenham there as well. So, yeah, I think I think it'll be an interesting middle middle table as well, I would say. Yeah, I mean, so it's my perspective, Neil. Are we looking more for trying to maintain or improving the points total last year but if it's me i know it sounds very binary but a cup run would be nice yeah i think that's that should be what liverpool are looking at this season from what emma's just said the way she's described it i think if liverpool can hold themselves close to the top of the bottom fourth or fifth uh through i think the other thing that's going to happen at the top of the middle sorry the other thing that's going to happen here a little bit as well is i think there's going to be i think momentum is going to matter for those sides in the middle liverpool last season i think are a demonstration of getting some I'm feeling mm -hmm. like you're in a groove and it's going well. We need to accept that it's possible that doesn't happen uh, this season from a Liverpool point of view, but they've still got to therefore battle through those moments a little bit. Um, um, the gulf between three and four, I think, is just it's just enormous, and it becomes difficult to you know to to, to imagine how you do it, especially off the back of a, a quietish summer. Um, and I think that Emma's spot on on the gulf between probably eleven and 10 and then what that therefore says is that there's two sides that almost every single time they, they step onto the pitch certainly if they're playing away from home they're going to get whacked um and i think that that's what you're going to see a bit of this season um then what i think you're going to see is a lot of hotly competitive matches between the sides who find themselves in the gap it sounds really reductive to say this but let's reduce it would be nice for liverpool to get off to a strong start with that home game against leicester and then the away game against West Ham. Because the reason why is because they are two of the most winnable games Liverpool get all season. They haven't got the room to slow, slow start Liverpool. Yeah. Uh, they need to, they, they almost, because what they don't want to do is end up feeling that they're at the bottom of the middle. Because that's where they could get dragged into something where it all feels a bit hard and a bit sad um, and a little bit tricky. I think you just don't want to be sad. So I think you're looking at those sorts of early games from a Liverpool point of view. You know, it's two aways, but if they could find a way to seven points off the back of it, 
and they're not they're not that far away from Crystal Palace at home as well. At which point, then there's a pathway through to ten, and you never know quite what happens in the game at Anfield against City. It's at Anfield, and there's other factors as well. And then there's a Merseyside derby on the horizon, and I just almost feel as though from Liverpool's point of view, when the points are there to be had before games and then against the better sides if you realise you're coming up against them on a day where you can get something I think Liverpool have just got to snaffle the points whilst they're there this season and that's how they'll manage to stay at fourth or fifth if they don't snaffle the points when they're there that's how it could be it could become ninth or tenth or it could become ninth or tenth by Christmas and we're all a bit like well this feels like a massive backward step and they might not be playing that much worse in the round they might, you know, the, the, the standard of football might not be that much worse than it was last season. It might just be that a little bit of luck's gone missing and grabbing opportunities has become a little bit tougher. And I think that what they don't need, I think one of the things that really helps last season is at no point do Liverpool feel the scoreboard pressure of the league table. So when opportunities are there to be grabbed, they're able to grab them. And that's why I think starting well is so important. I think if Liverpool start well, I think it's quite straightforward to imagine how they get to fourth or fifth. I think if they start badly, as I say, there's every chance that you're talking about ninth and tenth and and us all feeling like this isn't this isn't good enough when, as I say, it just might not be that much difference. And you've got to think as well, when you say there, Neil, about how you can quickly get to 10 points. Liverpool finished with 41 points last season and finished fourth in the table. So if you can get 10 points in the first five, six weeks, you're a quarter of the way through what you were last season. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, because I mean, but I know what Neil's saying about the uh, results Cause last year. A lot of results were great, but they were like two ones, three twos. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's it only takes two that being draws quite, and you drop down the league quite quickly. So, I mean, just I for listeners, why... so, yeah, just just Sorry. for listeners, you might not you might not be sort of aware. It's a last season, just to be really clear. Chelsea win the league on goal difference. Goal difference is fascinating. Chelsea win the league on goal difference, fifty three. City second, forty six. Arsenal third, thirty three. Liverpool fourth, eight. Man United fifth. 10 and then mm-hmm. no one else is positive Tottenham are minus 5 and everyone else is minus double figures Villa 16, Everton 13, Leicester finished 10th on 19, then you've got Brighton on 22, 25 and Br- Bristol, West Ham and Bristol go down with 50 this is the point, Liverpool, Liverpool's wins will be will be one goal wins uh, much of the time the aim is to, when the, when those are there to be grabbed, it's grabbing them. But as I say, I think you good habits breed good habits on that. But they also take the pressure off. It means that, for instance, if you're, you know, was to sort of extend through this this season run, I don't know who Tottenham have got in their first three, but Liverpool is the third one. And if Liverpool go to Tottenham and it's nil nil with twenty to go, and Tottenham haven't got a win yet, maybe Tottenham will feel a bit riskier, a bit edgier, a bit more pressure. At which point, Liverpool could then sneak up the other end, snatch one. And then from there, Liverpool, it feels like a massive away win. But part of what's happened is Tottenham have felt pressure that Liverpool haven't felt. And I think that happens last season for the Reds. And in the end, I think part of why they overtake United is United just got themselves into this situation where it was all a bit hard and all a bit sad and a bit miserable. Uh, Nothing was going for them. And Liverpool, things were going well. Things felt good. They felt upbeat. And, you know, the result against Chelsea felt possible for Liverpool in a way that I don't think it ever quite did for Manchester United. Yeah. At that period, and that that is what Liverpool need. They need to find the way to ride that tide again. Yeah, sp- spot on, spot on. So, Emma, in the Liverpool squad, who do you want to watch? Oh, um, good question. I think Sophie Roman Hogg because I think last season was the first season we saw. Um, bits of what she could do, but I'm excited to see what she can do with. Um, kind of a really solid attacking um, squad around there, I guess. Um, so people who can play off her, where she can really show up her hold up skills a little bit more, her, her aerial threat as well. Um, like having more runners in behind, I think will be really good. So, yeah, I'm kind of a, a intrigued to see if she'll go up another level, um, or whether just having players that play with her, um you know, we'll bring out the best of them as well, playing alongside her. So, yeah, I, I'd probably say she's probably my, my one to watch. Cool. Neil, who's your one to watch? And that's a really good shout, uh, and I feel ever so slightly like it was stolen from me uh, as we're <laughs> going to go through. I think I think not not in a uh, dissimilar way, Marie Hobinger. I think now it's got oh, a year of, of, get, of getting used to everyone. Sorry, Chris, we're doing this. We're all doing it. <laughs> We've got a year of getting used to it a little bit. Um I think it's in she's managed a little bit last season, I will point out. And I, I mean that as a compliment, not as, you know, I think her games are picked for her a little bit more last season. There's a little less room for that part of Cairns going is an aspect of that. Uh, I'm 
you know, I'm of the view that this is the year where she needs to just basically just be a, a part of fulcrum of that midfield sort of game in, game out, because she's got so much quality when you get around the final third. Cool. Uh, seeing you both stole my ones, um, I'll just say Gemma Bonner, because to be honest, that normally solves most problems. Which is <laughs> what, it's what she tends to do. For I'm intrigued anyway. to, well, I'm intrigued to see what's going to happen with Lundegaard this season. Mm. In that, there's yeah. now you think there's going to be a bit more pressure on her to step up a year to acclimatise, really mm. quite limited time on the pitch. I think she's interested and also looks like she's got a lot of quality when she can when she gets she, delivery, gets time to deliver the ball. I think me and Emma were saying, um, it's before she got her injury, said, she looked physically, you could see the advantages of um, Melwood because she looked physically stronger as in to play where she she looked more like a natural six, which is not a bad thing because it's kind of what Liverpool could do with someone who can do that job uh, but still has the technical ability that, that she does. So I think she she just gave us something a bit different and it was a shame really because she was just getting into a bit of a flow when she picked up at the injury, which is a bit of... Unfortunate for her because when she finally got a break, uh, a break into the squad, you know, unfortunately injuries curtailed the season. So yes, yeah, I mean, she's also another one to keep an eye out for. Cool. Right. So before we go, then um, obviously, Emma, you've obviously got about five articles coming out. Any of the things you need to check out for yourself? And the rest, um, just loads, loads of content. WSL season cracks on from the twentieth of September. So I am. Um, working all hours just to get loads of stuff out and then uh, hopefully have acquired the time in October. So, um, yeah, there's there's loads coming out basically across the, the website. Um, obviously, focus this week is on the transfer window, so deadlines on Friday. Um, so just if you can bear it, watch me, listen to me and, and read about what I'm saying. <laughs> Don't read about me, read about what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so... Make sure that you follow BBC website and also Emma's Twitter handle at Emma Sandy. M underscore Sandy. Oh, I'll yeah. get it right eventually. Although I did get a hat last week, so it was called something else, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. And Neil, obviously, uh, please buy his book. Um, yes, buy, please. And buy, and, and buy tickets to his event. He's got, yes. he's got one in, there's one in Liverpool, there's one in Belfast, one in Edinburgh, and one in London. Yes, do that. Uh, that'll be fabulous. Uh, if you can buy the book, even if you're thinking about buying it as a Christmas present, just buy it for the before order, pre-order it before the 26th of uh, September in this country, so it counts towards the uh, the total for week one, which is when we're trying to uh, get as high in the charts as possible. With my eyes still being solely on number one, so um, yes, uh, before the 26th or on the 26th is the is the aim. It's a big deal. Um, it's mad. Chris it's mad is getting a book for his Christmas. Um, just. Just, just, just to tell you, no surprise, you get a book for your Christmas. There you are. That's what I want. I, I mean, don't. I, also, just don't buy one. Maybe buy four or five, and, and many presents uh, <laughs> out there. Don't be shy. Uh, it's what everyone's always wanted. It looks nice. Yeah, it does. It's very. You haven't seen the book. The cover does look good. Uh, cool. Right. So on that happy note, then we'll speak to you all very soon. Please like. Please subscribe. Please follow Neil and uh, Emma stuff. You, you know where the Anfield rap is, obviously. Yeah, it's not hard. With the B- you also must know where the BBC is by now. Um, so make sure you follow us up and we'll be back probably in October to talk about hopefully the Reds being top of the league and ha! this is all great but you know or maybe just a cup run who knows until then speak to you soon